Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining this session about product and uh, feedback loops. It's a pleasure to be with you here today to talk about this critical topic for all builders. My name is Mehdi Risasi. Um, I'm lead product at AI71, where we build products that bring the benefits of AI to the world through responsible partnerships. Prior to that, I spent 12 years at Google and DeepMind, building and leading product teams that were working with cutting edge research. Those were some of the best labs in the world to do AI, and they built the underpinnings of what today is the generative AI revolution with breakthroughs like the Transformers, which is the T in ChatGPT. Just a quick reminder that though this is influenced by a lot of the work that uh, I was fortunate to see, None of this um, content reflects the views of the employers, right? So uh, maybe a show of hands here. Who is actually currently building a product? Yeah, a few, a few. Who has built a product in the past or products? Oh, great. And maybe the others are thinking of doing that. That's why you guys are, are joining this, um, this session. So when you build products, right, like you're trying to figure out the triangle of desirability, feasibility, and uh, sustainability, right? And the desirability one is probably the most important because without that one, you don't need to waste time on uh, the other ones that come after. Desirability means do users want to use your products and will they be using them? Do they, do they need them? To, to focus um, on that, usually, what you, what you do is you try to understand user needs, test a few assumptions that you have on that, and then iterate on those as you go. There are a few products that um, we all use that, that where you can learn and see that in practice. And given we are in the Nordics, I could not avoid talking about Spotify, right? Like, which is one of the iconic companies in the world that was built here uh, in, this, um, in this region. And so in Spotify, I enjoy massively the Discover Weekly or personalized playlist features that help you find new content that you wouldn't have found otherwise. A, a product that is built a bit similarly is YouTube, right? Like where the recommendation engine will suggest to you a number of videos to see based on what you are seeing. And one of the amazing insights I learned working with the YouTube team is that actually, the system doesn't know anything about the video that is showing you. It actually has no clue what's in that video. All it knows is what people who have watched that video have also watched, and then it suggests things to you to watch based on that. Imagine once these systems that we are currently developing to understand images and video, once they're ready, like what you will be able to do uh, for users with video uh, experiences. Another similar example is with Netflix, right? Like on the what to watch features where recommender systems will learn from your past history, things that people that have similar choices than you have looked at and suggest uh, things for you. There used to be a time where you probably spent more time trying to find a show than actually watching one. And it seems that it's improving over time. Another uh, one of these experiences where the company learns about user preferences that I landed on recently is actually the Genius Bar. I never thought at Apple, I never thought that it was for that. But a few weeks back, my nephew uh, managed to lock my laptop. I'm not sure how he did. He did the same to his sister a few days later. So we all ended up at the Apple store uh, and took our laptops to the Genius Bar. And I realized that they were not just doing customer support and helping you to fix the issues, but they were also learning about how you used their products in order to improve them. Ignoring user insights is incredibly dangerous, right? Like as you're iterating on finding your product. I remember in the early days of um, the Google Glass project when we were dog fooding it and I was excited enough to put that thing um, on me and walk around with it all the time. But after a few weeks, I couldn't understand what it was used for and what it would be helpful for. And so I just stopped using it. And nobody took into account the feedback of multiple users who were wondering about like, the use case for this. 
I guess the team was more excited about technical feasibility right first, um, and that led to technologies that we will see in the future um, happening, but at the time was perhaps too early. There are, there are many, many other examples of companies or products that failed because they ignored customer feedback or ignored the feedback of their early adopters. Um, an example maybe, again, from this part of the world is Nokia, right? Which unfortunately disappeared after the platform shift moving to smartphones. Um, and that's probably because of the life cycle there of feedback, right? Like you don't change your phone every day. Um, Yahoo is perhaps another example where previously search was this very manual labor intensive experience where they had a number of uh, ver portals and verticals, right? Like for each topic that interested you. While at the same time, Google developed PageRank, which given the growth, the massive growth of the internet, it was, wasn't possible for humans to catch up um, to so the Yahoo way of just having humans do that didn't work out and PageRank took over, right? The funny story you might know is that Yahoo passed on acquiring Google for $100,000. So I'm not sure if who was crazy um, the most there, the buyer or the, or the seller. And there are countless examples of these right um, there. What this uh, point is about is this continuous loop that people call product feedback loop of asking and gathering feedback from your users and then analyzing that feedback to understand what users want and then taking actions to improve your product. For the scientists in the room, this might sound to you like the scientific method that humans have used for thousands of years to do things. It actually is. It's just another name for it. I wouldn't want you to go away thinking that this um, method is actually a cookie cutter that you can use everywhere. There are countless examples also where um, it's actually not the right way to build your product. And it's mostly when either the timeline to feedback is too long or the cost of the experiment is incredibly high. So there are probably lots of VCs in the room. This wouldn't apply to you guys because of the long feedback cycle for you. It's similar in other areas like uh, drug discovery, where it takes many, many years to develop a drug, and that's at that moment that you know if it actually works or not. Or for things like the blockbuster, uh, movies, games, etc. So if we were to go a bit deeper into what do we actually do uh, when you look at building these product feedback loops, it starts with gathering feedback, right? Which sounds very easy, but actually it's not necessarily that straightforward. The first question to ask is what feedback are you trying to gather and also from whom, right? So if, like me, you were amazed by the early days of LLMs and uh, started to like, interact with them and were blown away by the fact that uh, you had these chatbots that sounded like almost humans and would pass the Turing test, you probably didn't miss that they sometimes make mistakes and they make them in a very, very confident way as they uh, spit out that information. This led to a number of uh, demos that um, saved off billions of dollars of market cap of various companies in the US and China. So there the idea is, unless you had an expert on that specific field that you were asking questions about, you might have missed uh, the, the correct answer. And that's why evals in LLMs are incredibly important. And people spend a lot of time now to build these teams that are only focused on building the evals, which means what data do they gather and what, do they, what will they measure? The second step to, um, that you have to do in, this, in your product feedback loop journey is to now analyze and prioritize this information, right? So here, um, you, you're trying to filter for the noise, right? And like find the, the signal in all these streams of, of data. There are some cases where it's incredibly easy and simple, and others where it's a bit more complicated. So when, for example, we were using very advanced algorithms like Mu0 to improve the effectiveness of uh, large-scale computing or save 5% of uh, bandwidth for YouTube, that it was easy, right? Like you just say, oh, it saved 5% of bandwidth, so it's great, it works. But in other cases, 
the improvements were so small that you needed to use a number of like statistical methods where reasonable people might disagree on um, the, the outcome and the results. If you remember, there was a famous case of an advertising company uh, where the engineers calculated wrong metrics about the impact of their products. Um, and that, of course, was in their favor as people were spending more and more on their, um, on their products. There are some other cases, one that's very, uh, that I like um, immensely, was when we used WaveNet, which is a generative AI algorithm from actually seven, eight years ago when the term wasn't even uh, known. But this is a text-to-speech algorithm where you can recreate uh, voices in their exact, exactly how they sounded. So we used it for people who have neurodegenerative diseases that get them to lose their voice. And you can see the result really quickly, right? Like if this is, the feedback is incredibly quick. You see it on the faces of their families and loved ones as they hear again the, the voice of um, the, 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 current, uh, the current voice that was lost, unfortunately. Um, then the third step is to decide and take an action based on this information, right? Like that you've, um, that you've had. At AI71, we build a number of vertical specialized agents for various fields. And in some, with some of our partners, there is a t type of data that is incredibly important to them. That's tables, structured data, and images, graphs. So as we were working on our uh, algorithms we realized, and with them, we realized that there was a huge um, need from them. And so we prioritized building these. And thanks to that, now we have uh, reasoning engines and data ingestion engines that are incredibly good at tables and images, and that help uh, our partner immensely. Perhaps the last point here is that you need to follow up with your customers, right? Like you have to take the time after you have uh, done the data gathering, data analysis, taken a decision on what you will implement. You have to spend time listening to your customers, partners, understanding how that impacted them, what they learned from it, what they would suggest to change again. And it's not the end of the whole process, right? Like you again need to do uh, another loop. And you'll probably be doing many, many of these on your product journey as it in reality never stops, right? As we say, products are either shipped or, or killed. So you should be shipping all, all the time. Uh, metrics that align to the goals that you have uh, are very important. If you, if you want to measure something, it's really hard for you to act on it, right? And here, I'm sure you've seen many other examples and ways of doing this, but sharing perhaps two um, that can be quite, quite useful. So there are reactive, metric, re reactive feedback mechanisms, but also proactive ones. In the, in the reactive ones, this will happen after users have used your product. And you've seen, for example, like CSAT surveys or NPS scores, et cetera. Uh, when I was in the organization that, uh, where Google Cloud started, we had a whole team whose sole job was to focus on CSAT. Uh, and so they regularly run these customer satisfaction surveys, improved them massively, and regularly updated the whole company at all hands about um, what, what was going on there so that everybody can take that into account. It's important to invest in this. The second bit is this proactive feedback, right? Where this time, it will probably be while users are uh, in your products that they will see um, integrated into the workflow insights that the product teams will use to improve the experience. In LLMs, you see it with like the thumbs up, thumbs down type um, uh, buttons that are, are there, right? So now, now that we understand a bit what these product uh, feedback loops are, here are a few ways to think about them as you embark on your, on your journeys. So the first one maybe is to perhaps think about redesigning the product to include these mechanisms that would um, enhance your knowledge of your users. What, what this means is that, um, for example, you can do, we just touched on the thumbs up, thumbs down, right? Like these help improve the models. There are a few others like A-B tests, right? Like where you will show to different types of, um, of users different UIs, for example, which is things that we had done, uh, and then pick the one that resonates the most with, with them. 
when we were building a, um, an app for clinicians to look at patient data, we tried various examples of the UI, playing with different colors on the various buttons, and then used the results of this to pick the best um, UI for our, uh, for our users. The um, second idea here is to actually integrate with other products so that you can gather and use this, this feedback. If you think about LLMs, they're incredibly useful when they're combined with other tools and software out there. So you can think of, you're maybe planning, you're planning a trip to come to Helsinki. Maybe you went to your favorite um, LLM instead of your favorite search engine, as you'd have done maybe a few years back. Um, and then you'd have compiled the output of it into a document editor or a spreadsheet and played with it, right? Like maybe there are suggestions that didn't work out with your schedule. Perhaps there were things that have closed that the LLM didn't know. A hallucination happened there, right? So the LLM could learn by having access to that document editor of what you have decided to do, what you followed, and what you didn't, so that it improves itself over time. So as, as we embark on this um, AI journey and change a bit the platforms that we use, there will be many, many opportunities to include new ways of gathering feedback into, into the products. The third, um, ex a third example is this idea of having a human on the loop. So a former colleague of mine used to joke that uh, it, it's not the ML era, but it's the MML era. So you would call it manual machine learning. And humans are still labeling a ton of data and improving the, the models for AI to actually uh, work very efficiently. And so here, you would have humans that actually help train and improve the models. It's what our LHF did, right? Like, which enabled ChatGPT to be this incredible tool that we have. But also, there are many, many other fields where you can do that. When we were developing this um, AI-assisted diagnostics tool for eye doctors, what it did was it looked at 3D images of the eye, and then it diagnosed if you had macular degeneration or a diabetic retinopathy or a number of other diseases. And you had a doctor who would look at the, um, the outcome and say that oh, this was misdiagnosed or actually this was, a, um, this was correct. And through this feedback, like the algorithm learns and improves continuously. The fourth thing that's probably really key to have in mind is to unlearn and relearn things, right? Like, if you are in a very, very early stage product discovery phase, a lot the data that you generate and create and the learnings you have probably outweigh what you knew before. And so it's important not to be biased by previous information or to over-index on what you knew before. You should keep a very open mind and regularly challenge your priors and integrate the new information and feedback that you get from interactions with users, from how they use your product, from what's also happening in your broader environment with competitors and partners, and integrate that into the whole product so that you can make accurate decisions for, for your next steps. Now, in this new AI era, a ton of more data is being generated all the time, right? And that means that this exercise of I'm going to gather data, I will analyze it, I will make a decision on it, and then I'll keep doing this loop, becomes even, even, even more, more complicated because you have tons more data, things move way faster than before. And so what that means is perhaps you can try to integrate these tools into your product decision making and benefit from them too. Um, you can have systems that adapt way faster to user trends and needs. You can integrate feedback automatically into your products without um, even having to think about it way too much because you've set the foundations and redesigned your products to integrate that. That will massively improve decision making for you. And then a point that's really important and probably under-evaluated currently is that you can personalize the experiences. And not just the content that you show different people, right? Like you can show different people different things based on their interests, but it's also the UI that you do that with. Currently, a lot of the UIs for LLMs have been chatbots, 
But that is not the only UI that's uh, ideal for interacting with the capabilities of these models, right? In a chatbot, it's hard to go find information. It's hard to take it elsewhere. The way you have images, tables, graphs, etc., cetera, is not, um, is not very, very simple. So there's a lot more that you can experiment and do with this as we embark on, the, on integrating these tools into uh, our products. And then a very important point, again, that is important to always remember is uh, responsibility and ethical considerations in this. There, there are a lot of things that we don't yet control and know about how um, the biases that we're integrating into the models, the way that data has been processed, the explainability of the, um, of the solutions. And so it's incredibly critical to make sure that you um, have a responsible and thoughtful approach to, um, to, these, to these questions. Now, thank you for taking the time to um, learn and discuss about product feedback loops. I'm really excited to see what all the builders here do with the new tools at their disposals. Um, and we're very happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, in the dedicated time. Thank you very much.